in Jesus' name, was a very short night. As most of you understand and know, I'd like us to stand today and worship the Lord for a moment. It's such a wonderful thing to be with the people of God. Anytime, anywhere, any place, it's just a wonderful thing to be in the presence of others who love Jesus the way you love Jesus. And sometimes people don't know for sure if they do or not, but then after we're together for a while, then they decide they do, and everyone prays through, we call it, and we're back on track. And I feel like we're sort of on track this morning, but you know, singles sort of stay on track one way or another. And I like that. I've made this comment many times, that when you preach singles conferences, you're sort of ruined for anything else. <laughs> really you are. Because people worship here, and there's hunger here, and there's unity here, and there's one accord here. And people love each other, and we have no access to the mind, and there are no politics here. We just want to be used by God, and we want to know the truth, and we want to get more involved with Jesus. Everyone say amen. amen. This is strictly a teaching session. It's a condensed, really it's a condensed version of something I've been working with called Three Kinds of Christianity. Though I'm not going to go through that whole session, but there's a part of it that I want to transmit to you today which I feel is probably one of the most vital things in this hour. Do you understand what it means to believe that there is only one God? Do you understand what that means? It means that you are the most privileged person on the face of the earth. Because the oneness doctrine is as old as God himself. It is the oldest doctrine in existence. One God and only one. And the devil's great effort from the time of his fall until now is to get people by whatever means to worship more than one God. Any God, many gods, as long as it is not the one true God. That is what drives him crazy. There's people who worship only one God. And when you know that one God, if you know what his name is, you, became, you become rather extremely dangerous. And so I want to read today a verse of scripture found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. The whole of Judaism is based upon this particular commandment from the Lord. <clears throat> this truth, this utterance from the Lord. It is the whole of the foundation of Judaism. In fact, if you've ever gone to Israel, and if you ever go to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, as Christians call it, if you go there, if you can say what the Jewish people call the Shema, if you can say it in Hebrew, they would assume that you're Jewish because it is the core of their faith. And if you can say it in Hebrew, they wouldn't understand that a Gentile would ever be able to say that verse of scripture in the original language. So they'll take you in, and I can say it without accent. So, I get away with a lot of things at the way they wall because they don't know exactly who I am. And I'll tell you more about that after we read the scripture because you need to be seated. It was a short night and I can tell by looking at some of you, you're weary. <laughs> <clears throat> the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Let's read it together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And the next verse in Hebrew is, Ve'achavta et Adonai Elohecha bechol levavcha 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. The whole of Judaism is based upon this truth. And the whole of apostolic Christianity is based upon this truth. Not Trinitarian Christianity, but apostolic Christianity was based upon this truth. One God and only one. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Would you clap your hands for the Lord today? And please like I have about 47 minutes to do this session. So, let's lift our hands again and worship the Lord. I'm going to get this clock fixed so I can see. As I was saying, because I can say the Shema and say it without accent, I get away with things in Israel, especially in their prayer places that you wouldn't normally get away with. For example, the Jews are very jealous of their country, and I don't blame them. They, at this point, do not want Christian missionaries coming there and hounding them to be converted, and I understand that. Because they have been hounded for centuries and centuries and centuries throughout all of Europe and the countries wherein they have been dispersed through the diaspora. So now that they have their own country, their own nation, they do not want missionaries coming there and trying to convert their people. And I understand that. Although they need what I have. And they don't understand that. But we understand that. But there is a, something called wisdom. God help us to be baptized with wisdom, if there is such a thing. We need, and in addition to that, a double portion of common sense would be extremely important. Some people are not even close to common sense. It just common sense will tell you a lot of things. Do you realize that God gave you a head to do more than hold your ears apart? He did. If you would just concentrate on what is in here and use it, you could save yourself a great deal of trouble. That's not in my notes, that's all for free. But, as we continue in this session today, Israel <clears throat> is trying desperately to survive. And they have many enemies, exactly as we have many enemies. So when I'm at the Wailing Wall, and I am praying, I can hear those old rabbis coming, and I have very good peripheral vision, so I can see them coming, and I know what they're doing, they're checking me out. Because even though I may look something like them, and I've got the kippah on, and the yarmulke, or the skull cap, as they call it, they still don't know exactly who I am. But so when they come near, I lift my voice slightly, and I say the Shema, and they keep on going, because they think, and I've learned enough phrases in Hebrew that I can pray in Hebrew, and they think that I am one of them. On this last tour, this spring, one of the young men with me, we a bunch of us had come in to pray, and he was speaking with tongues, and one of those young rabbis came to him when he walked away from the wall, and they said, if you want to speak with tongues, go to a Christian church. So they're on to us. They know what's going on now, so you've got to be more tactful. And uh, I understand what's going on. I do understand. But Jesus is going to make a way somewhere for the truth to get to his natural people. But in the end time, in the mean, meantime, we as the spiritual people need to get with the program and go after it and defend this truth with everything that is within us. When Judaism ever finds out that we are monotheistic, there is a real possibility that they will embrace Christianity. Because about three years ago, I took a group of men to meet Rabbi Getz who at that time was in control of the Western Wall, or the Wailing Wall. And in his office, after we had 
talked with him, prayed, and many of us wept while the old man spake. I wrote to him when I got home. I have a tremendous letter from him. He has since passed away, but he made the most exciting statement to me and to us as we left his office. Now this is an Orthodox rabbi who has fought in his youth in all the wars of Israel, but now he's in charge of the most holy site in all of the whole land to Judaism, the Wailing Wall. And this man, with his authority, his expertise, his experience, his Judaism, his Jewry, this man says to me and my group, he said in all of history, he said Judaism and Christianity ran in parallel lines, totally opposite from each other. They ran along in parallels. He said, but I can see that there's a possibility they will come together. Because he found out that we believed in one God and only one. The difference between us is they don't know that their one God walked down an ivory staircase to a low manger and became Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. They don't know and understand that the God of Abraham wrapped himself in flesh and blood and his name was called Yahashua. And that he would save his people, or as they say most of the time, Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach, which means Jesus the Messiah. I thank God for the truth today. I thank God for the truth today. You know more than 99% of all the people on the face of the earth. And the devil fears the oneness of God more than he fears anything else in existence. The Bible says the devil believes that there is one God and that he fears and he trembles. So when you come walking down the street, when you come walking into life, wherever he is in control or trying to get control, you become the terror of terrors to him. Because your truth drives him in common everyday street vernacular, bananas. He cannot handle the truth of one God. He trembles on it. Brother Barnes told me once in his life, in his prayer life, he said, I was so fasting and praying and so frustrated over some things. He said, I wanted to work on the devil. I wanted to torment him. I wanted to destroy him. He said, so I was in my office praying and I was fasting also. And he said, the power of God came in my office until fire raced around the ceiling. And I could hear the crackle of it. And he said, the power of God was in that place. And he said, Jesus, he said, you say that you are the door. He said, I want to walk through the door. Everybody comes up to the door. He said, but I want to walk through the door. I want to get on the other side of you. I want to get in where you really are. He said, so my request is that I can walk through the door. And he said, Jesus heard me and he granted my petition. And he said, I literally took a huge step and walked through something into something I had never been into before. He said, once I got in there, he said, Jesus, I have one request. I want you to walk into Lucifer's chamber. I want you to walk into his throne room. I want you to engrave on the back of his throne. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He said, I want to torment the devil. But that would keep you off the throne, wouldn't it? If you hated the oneness of God, it would keep you running in torment all of the time. Let's clap our hands again. And listen to the Lord. In the beginning, in the beginning, there was only Judaism, paganism, heathenism, 
or after the day of Pentecost, there was Christianity. Before Christianity, God dealt with the natural people, his Jews, and, or his Hebrew children, as they were called. They were his. He said, you're mine, the apple of my eye. My investment is in you, and on and on the scriptures and the promises went. So, in the world before, Jude before Christianity, Judaism was the only faith that worshipped the one true God. Everything else was, he was heathenistic, and they worshipped more than one God. They were pagans, they were heathens, they were brutal in their worship. They worshipped their own sons in in, or sacrifice their own sons in fire and they destroy their own people etc 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 that's not the point this morning so I don't want to major on that but hedonism was vile and corrupt and it was diabolical and it was demonic but then when Christianity was born it really was Judaism extended real Christianity is ancient Judaism extended. That is what it really is. Because Judaism is the root structure. It's the roots. But we are the branches and the fruit and the flowers of all of that that you read about in the Old Testament. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. We found it. The Bible says in Hebrews, they without us were not made perfect. So our roots are in Judaism. If you don't believe it, go to a Baptist church. They don't worship the way we do. They don't clap. They don't shout. They don't run. They don't dance. Because they're not ancient Christianity. They're not. Not by any stretch of the imagination of the ancient Christianity. They are Reformation Christian. They're a reformed version of something else they didn't like. We are before them. All of the denominational Christianity is only 490 years old as of this year. But what you're seated among here today is 1,964 years old. This is the original Christianity. This is it. We will clap your hands again and we'll be worship tomorrow. Jesus, I worship you today. I praise you for the wonderful touch of God that is in this house. Will you, by the touch of the Master's hand, by the sound of his voice, will you come into this place alive, powerfully, refreshingly, with revelation and understanding? We cannot fail to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I wonder what would happen if we all really clapped and lifted our voices. coming to our services. This man is very wealthy. He's inherited his father's business. 
and he has come to our services and I've told him about you and about your love for Judaism and he wants to meet you. So our luncheon was arranged and I went to this luncheon and uh, we arrived before he did and we already had ordered before Julian walked in. But Julian walked in and he spotted um, Brother Tharp and he came to the uh, table where we were and he seated himself, actually it was a booth, he seated himself and um, I was introduced and we did some surface talk for a couple of moments and then he ordered and we began to talk to converse more in depth and I said to him, I said, Julian, I want to know how it is that you ever found us, how is it that you ever came to us? He said, the story is, is complicated, he said, but I'll make it short, he said, I was raised an Orthodox Jew. He said, but in Orthodoxy, in spite of all the laws that we keep and all the rituals and traditions we keep, he said, as I read the Old Testament, he said, I could not find in my modern day Judaism any power of God demonstrated anywhere. He said, I, re I read and read about the mighty acts that God did in the Old Testament for his people. And he said, I kept asking rabbis, where is that power today? Why doesn't God do these things for us now that he did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the prophets of old? And he said, I never could get an answer. He said, so I was hungry. He said, I became hungry to find the power of God. He said, so secretly, I began to read the New Testament. He said, in my secret readings of the New Testament, he said, I came to believe that this Jesus of the Christians was truly my Jewish Messiah. He said, I came to believe he was my Messiah. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That does not mean just preaching and exposing yourself to preaching. If you as a believer will spend time in the word of God, your faith will rise dramatically because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the more you read it, the more faith you will have in your heart, in your life. Yes. And to quote it, it becomes powerful. Yes. I have been alone reading in my own home the word of God, and suddenly it was like the words just spoke out loud audibly to me. The power of the word of God, the reality of yes. God's word was so great. And I would break down weeping and crying and feel the brush of angels' wings, the sound of his voice, the touch of his hand. That's why it's been so valuable through the centuries that Bibles have been dispersed about foreign lands, whether the preachers were there to accompany or not, because once a Bible gets into the hands of anyone, if they read it, faith will become born and the journey to full truth begins. Most of us here did not start in Pentecostalism. We started somewhere else, but faith, the Word of God, led us through some rough places for some of us, but step by step it led us to the truth. And so it was with Julian. He said, I began to believe that this Jesus was indeed my Jewish Messiah. He said, so then I decided I would go to these Christian churches. And he said, the only Christianity that basic Judaism knows about is Roman Catholicism. He said, so I went to a Catholic church to try to find this Jesus that I read about in the New Testament. He said, but he said, when I walked into a Catholic church, he said, for a Jew, there's no difference between walking into a Catholic church and the Temple of Zeus. He said the statuary 
all of the icons, the idols. He said it has always been forbidden to Jews. He said to us it is total idolatry. There was nothing there. I couldn't feel any power at all. He said, I knew this could not be the Jesus I had read about. He said, so then I went to the Lutheran church. He said, I had much the same experience there. I couldn't feel anything. Nothing happened for me. He said, then I went, he said, I went to every church there is. My parents, he said, never knew about this. He said, but I kept looking, I was searching. Isn't it amazing the people you meet on the streets? You have no idea that secretly they're trying to find the truth. You pass them by, you sit beside them in restaurants, you talk, you sit beside on planes, and you don't know that in their heart they're looking for the thing you got. So, he said, finally, I went to a Baptist church. He said, aha, here I could feel something. They preached about this Jesus. And he said they sang about him. But he said there wasn't any real power there. Now this is not me speaking. This is a Jewish young man who is schooled backwards and forwards in the scriptures. Who had taken his bar mitzvah. Who can quote pages and pages and pages and chapters of Old Testament scripture. He said it. I'm not saying it. I'm telling you what he said. He said... Then someone invited me to an Assembly of God church. He said, here, there was some power. He said, and these people did what I had read about. They spoke with tongues, some of them, not all of them. He said, they didn't, didn't seem to all feel it was necessary. He said, but they were hung up on three gods. He said, they had three people in the Godhead. He said, he said, I knew that could not be the truth because there's only one God. He said, so I knew this was not the place for me. He said, and I was so frustrated. He said, but then someone invited me to this United Pentecostal Church. He said, Brother well, Stone King, and at this point, he laid down his fork and pointed a finger at me across the table. He said, when I walked in to your services, he said, I knew that this was the truth. He said, I knew that this was the thing I had been looking for. He said, the tapping, the shouting, the dancing, the worship. He said, it was so Jewish. Do you know that in the beginning of Christianity, especially the Reformation period, in, in, into that area particularly, that a lot of Protestant churches would not have an organ in their services because it sounded too Jewish to them? That's from the strip. But anyway, Julian went on and he said to me, he said, you people are nothing more or nothing less than ancient Judaism extended. He said, you people are what we were supposed to become, but we missed it. And this Orthodox Jew. So, you can clap your hands here this morning and just scream and shout and say, I've got it. Christians went everywhere 
They tore up everything they came in contact with in the beginning. Because in the beginning there was only one kind of Christianity. If you said you were a Christian, they automatically knew that you believed this Jesus was the Messiah. That he had been apprehended, had gone through a trial, had been condemned, was crucified, buried, but that you believed he had come out of the grave victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And that you believed he had ascended to heaven, and that you believed and professed he had sent back his spirit or a comforter. So they knew in the beginning that you as a Christian spoke with tongues. And that you were baptized in the name of this one who had died for your sins. And that you believed there was only one God. And they also knew you could lay hands on people and cast out devils. They also knew that you could lay hands on the sick and they would recover. They knew that Christians were endued with a power that caused them to manifest the power of God. Because that's what Christianity was in the beginning. In the beginning, Pentecost was a fire. It was a wind. It was a shaking. It was angels visiting prisons. It was kings falling dead from their thrones. It was people pouring out of rooms, staggering under the power of the Spirit of God, speaking in languages out of their heads. It was a recklessness. It was the kind of preaching that caused revival or riot. It was the kind of preaching that tore everything upside down. I would to God we could preach again the way the apostles preached in the beginning. I think we're too formal. I think we had too much stuff. I think we make too many apologies. I think we're worried about making someone's spirits. I think that we are too involved in being a politics. I think we need to preach it. I may never get to where I thought I was going, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is to do what we feel in the spirit. Would you lift your hands again and worship the Lord? Because there are still people coming in this morning to this session. Jesus, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. John Maxwell. I'll get flack over that. I was in another particular uh, large conference, huge conference, and I went through Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and a bunch of these men and some of the damnable doctrines that they preach and teach and nonsense they stand for and the people they lead astray. And I was going through it. You know that Benny Hinn wrote a book entitled Good Morning Holy Spirit. And in that book he says that there are three persons in the Godhead and each one of those persons has three different personalities. That makes nine personalities in the Godhead. And the whole Trinity world was upside down with him and demanded he recall the book, the publisher, everything. He never has recalled the book. Now what kind of nonsense is it to have nine personalities here? The Holy Ghost has three different personalities, the Son has three different personalities, and the Father. What kind of nonsense is this? That doesn't come from heaven, that comes out of the pit, that type of thing. The devil loves That's his message. So in this conference, I was preaching what all of these people really stand for, that the average Pentecostal doesn't even know what they really believe. They just pick up their books, 
They pick up David Wilkerson's books, they read his material, and all of this stuff. And they have no idea what these people really, really stand for. But I know what they stand for. So I was telling this, and I named them. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul named them. <laughs> So I went through it and I said, if these people have the guts to preach that stuff, I have the guts to expose that. But there were some of the staff that didn't think I should have named them. So they called me in. And my message simply was basically, get yourself another speaker. I've got more to do than I can take care of. I don't need the hassle. But they don't want another speaker because they want me to get the crowds. That's exactly what they're doing and I know what they're doing. I've had discerning of spirits for years and the word of knowledge. I don't call people out, but I can read you like a book. I know what you're doing and why you're doing it. That's how I've survived for 34 years among you. I can read you. I know. That's for free, too. Let's clap again. I am here today to tell you that people of the truth need to stand up for the truth. Jimmy Swagger. Everybody says his ministry is washed up, he's finished. In his own group he is. But the truth of the matter is, if he came and repented and got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, really got it, and was baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of his sins, he could start all over again. Because that man's never ever really been saved. He'll die in disgrace unless he meets someone like me that's got the guts to tell him. <laughs> the rest of us just pat it. When he's never been saved. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. He had this vision of going to heaven and seeing the Son of the right hand of the Father. Wrote that. Wrote against us. When he wrote against us, that was his demise. He went down from that moment. You can't fight us and survive. No one's ever fought. Someone sent word to me, it was last year, early, early last year, almost two years ago now. They said, they sent word to me, they said, Brother Stone King, if you keep preaching the way you're preaching, all doors are going to close to you. You're going to have to change your thinking and loosen up. You're preaching too much holiness and you're too straight. As an evangelist, you're not going to survive. I sent word back to him. I said, go back and tell him that I will preach this message and no other message. I'll preach this message to the squirrels behind my house and we'll be nuts together. But I will preach this Free from what? 
free from every other ideology, every other doctrine. Nobody would ever convert me. They don't have a beggarman's chance with me. They don't have a chance with me. I'm not into all that. I'm into this. I've, I've got it, and I know that I've got it. And it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. There's nothing that can compare with this. I, I give this to people on planes sometimes as I travel to executives and I was talking with this one businessman one day and he was, he was impressed. I, what I was saying was getting, getting to him and he finally turned around and he said, who are you anyway? He said, what kind of a Christian are you? I said, well, I'm an apostolic Christian. He said, what's that? I said, I, said, I don't belong to all that mess that came out of church history. I have nothing to do with that. I'm not connected with it. I'm not a Protestant. Do you know that I'm not a Protestant? I'm not protesting anything. I'm an apostolic Christian. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Lutheran. I'm not a Presbyterian. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Mormon. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not a Christian. I am an apostolic, Pentecostal Christian. That's what I am. So in the beginning, in the beginning there was only one kind of Christianity. You were either a Christian, an all out and out pagan, or you were a Jew. But now, if you say, I am a Christian, you ask someone, well, someone walks up and says, I'm a Christian, and you ask someone, are you a Christian? They say, yes. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. You've got to find out what kind of a Christian they are before you even know how to begin to negotiate them. Because depending on what kind of a Christian they are, you have to start from there to go where you want to go. I know what Baptist Christians believe. I find that he's a Baptist, and if especially if he's a Southern Baptist, it means he's got a little more fire than the others and I can get away with more with him. If someone says they're Presbyterian, I know what that's all about too. You, if you go to that, if you're a member of that church and you have a cold, take a muffler with you because sneezing is a major offense there. It will upset the whole service. Here you could die and nobody would know you were dead. you under the people at the end of the service who we'll get around and resurrect you so it doesn't matter. Just take a break and check out. We'll check you back in. That's how it is. That's how it is. It was never designed for scoffers and mockers. It's only designed for the hungry and the thirsty. It only works for the hungry and the thirsty. It does not work on anyone else. It was never designed for them. But to the hungry, to the hungry, bread and water is a banquet. To the overweight, the overstuffed, the overindulgent, they want the best new delicacy can be served. It's just wrong with our churches in Pentecost. We no longer are thrilled with the truth. We no longer are thrilled with what God has done for us. We want to be entertained more and more and more. But a person in off the street who's never heard it, the simplest story about Jesus in the mighty will cause tears to run down their face. God take us back to those tender places where just the mention of his name caused our heart to beat faster. God take us back to the place where just a hymn would cause us to tremble in the presence of the Lord. Mm. He wants to take us back to those places. He's trying. He really is trying in our hour 
to take us back to our first love. Pray for preachers like you've never prayed for preachers before. I taught this, I taught this in the School of Missions, and I think I may be on to something. I'll let you judge. But <clears throat> our preachers, in this hour, it's not the saints that have gone bad, it's the preachers. But the devil knows if he can smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. So pray for your pastor, as we've never prayed for him before. Pray, pray for our preachers. Here's why I'm saying this. Do you remember, probably 10, 12 years ago now it's been, we heard about this, and we, we preached about it a little bit, made reference to it, we, we stirred a little bit, but we just sort of dropped it. And I think that's where we missed it when we dropped it. Do you remember that we were told it was written about, some people had met them on planes and they divulged this, that the witches in America fasted and prayed to Lucifer and offered pigs on altars as animal sacrifices to bring down every preacher of the gospel in America. Do you remember that? And it stirred us for a while. And then it was dropped. I think some of us fasted a little bit, went a couple days and got too hungry. Thought, uh, well, you know, broke it, went on played golf, racquetball, and we forgot it. But the witches didn't forget it. And though they're not more powerful than we are, yet there is a power connected with darkness. And I think if we had risen to the occasion and met it head on with intercessory prayer and fasting and prayer, united effort in our movement, I think we could have blown some things totally to pieces. I really think we could have. But you see, they went after the Trinitarians first, and they came down because they have nothing to fight it with. Because the only people on the face of the earth that can do intercessory prayer and spiritual warfare a oneness apostolic people. Trinitarians cannot do spiritual warfare. They cannot engage in spiritual warfare because they don't have the name of Jesus, they don't have the revelation of who God is. Most of them don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're not baptized in Jesus' name, so they are powerless when it comes to intercessory prayer. They can pray for their son to be admitted to the local college. They can pray for a better job. They can pray for natural things. And God answers prayer. I was in the Evangelical Free Church. I did that. God answered natural things for me. But I knew nothing about spiritual warfare until after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was baptized in Jesus' name. It was then that I became involved in face-to-face -face combat with forces of darkness. But I learned early on that they had to back away from me when I came walking toward them. Because I have got the power that forces demonic influences out. I've got the power. Say, I've got the power. Say, I've got the power. Lucifer himself, they would not move Lucifer. But what am 
apostolic baptized in Jesus' name, dedicated and consecrated, would cause him to back away. The most the most backslidden person here, the weakest one here among us today, down on their knees, pray, cause the devil to tremble. Cause him to absolutely tremble. And all the time you're going down on your knees, the devil is saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And every time he says, don't do it, he's back and forth and farther away. Because he cannot handle what's about to happen. The moment you say, in the name of Jesus. feel like we missed something back there and now they have gone after us that force of darkness has gone after our preachers our people to destroy them but they're having a real bad time of it a real bad time of it it's not going too smoothly if you could see the devils that are just mangled bleeding and just broken to pieces it would do your heart good it would just see Say, I've got it. <laughs> what have you got? You've got the power <laughs> to drive out the forces. <laughs> You've got the power to have revival in the area. I have closed down taverns in my area. I've driven by them and cursed them in Jesus' name for weeks. One day they catch on fire and more than 20% burns and the city will let them rebuild as a tavern. There's one that's been closed now for five years. 